Joshua chapter 1, verses 3 through 18. Here's the word of the Lord to us this morning. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give to them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And Joshua commanded the officers of the people, pass through the midst of the camp and command the people, prepare your provisions. For within three days you are to pass over this Jordan to go in to take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. And to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, Remember the word that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God is providing you a place of rest and will give you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your livestock shall remain in the land that Moses gave you beyond the Jordan. But all the men of valor among you shall pass over armed before your brothers and shall help them until the Lord gives rest to your brothers as he has to you. And they also take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to the land of your possession and shall possess it, the land that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you beyond the Jordan toward the sunrise. And they answered Joshua, All that you have commanded us we will do, and wherever you send us we will go. Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your commandment and disobeys your words, whatever you have commanded him, shall be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. Amen? Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And we ask, Father, that you would come now and speak through the preaching of your word, that our hearts might be caught up in a grand picture of how powerful and glorious and majestic you are. You are a good Father. You have called us to you. You have provided a way of escape from the valley of sin. You've given us the promise of life in the cross of Christ in the empty tomb. And I pray, Father, that you would make that clear to us as we study this passage, that you would come and do work in our hearts and our minds, that you would transform our lives. We trust that this is what you want to do and that this is what you will do. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I studied a section of scripture this week. I uh, came across a quote in a commentary. That's how the quote goes. All I need to do for my heart to harden after God has spoken his word is nothing. 
It's all that I need to do for my heart to become hard after hearing the preaching of God's word and hearing his word is to do absolutely nothing. And those words uh, from that author, um, I think, are a warning to us in the church today. Because again, the only thing that produces a hardened heart in any of us is a refusal to put our faith into obedient action. But the question is, is how do you do obedience? Right? How do you do obedience? Uh, every day for us uh, is yet uh, one more opportunity. Right? You, you think of the days that we live out in our lives. Every moment, every second of every day that we live is another opportunity to receive the promises that God communicates to us from His Word and to receive the commands and the instructions that God gives us in His Word with eagerness. Every day is an opportunity to receive the promises and the commands of God with eagerness and then, and then, to, and then to walk away from that and, and to, to, to willingly and eagerly authenticate our faith through obedient action. This has got to sound familiar for some of you, right? If you think through the general tone, doesn't that sound like somebody in the New Testament named James? Uh, sadly, um, this is not often the story uh, of, of the Western church, the modern church. We live in America, so I'll say the American church. Not often the story we find. What we often find in the modern church is a church full of people who are gripped by fear, they're gripped by laziness, they're gripped by stubbornness, outright indifference to the pursuit of personal holiness that is proven by faith-filled, obedient action. Oftentimes, this is what we find. Uh, the modern believer, uh, if, if you can, if it's even appropriate to use the word believer um, in this description, um, would rather be entertained, uh, would, would rather be coddled in their sin, would rather be encouraged with a pep talk, would, would rather be made to feel comfortable with the world, would rather be given another opportunity to consume yet another experience as if the God of the universe actually exists to do all of those things and none of the things that Scripture actually describes him as doing. This is a sad picture of the church today that you and I are part of. As a local expression, we, we have to admit that we fall into this easily, if not run to these things hungrily, thirstily, right? And the only thing that I need to do for my heart to harden towards God's word after hearing it is to do what? Nothing. And this is why this passage that we are studying today is so invigorating, it's fascinating, it's convicting. See, Joshua chapter 1 is a call to action. Really, it's a call to action. Anybody here like action movies of any sort? Like action. I love a good action movie. This book is a, it's a call to faith-filled, obedient action based on what? Just the fact that you should go be obedient? Well, you, then you'll idolize obedience if that is the case, which is common in the church today, too. This call to faith-filled, obedient action is not based on a simple love to brag about our obedience. This call to faith-filled, obedient action, it's based on none other than the rock-solid, timeless, enduring, faithful, trustworthy, whatever other adjectives you want to put to it, promises and commands of God. That's what our obedience is based on. The promises and the commands of God. 
When you reject God's instruction, you reject His promise. Our God is a God who speaks. He's not deaf and dumb. He doesn't miss a thing. He's not hiding out in the back room behind this uh, curtain like that weird little wizard turning the cranks in the Wizard of Oz. That's not the God that we serve. God hears all things. He sees all things. He knows all things. He has a fresh spoken word for every one of you and I in every season. And the question is, is will we listen for it and will we obey it? That is the question. His word here in Joshua is really simple. It's the title of the sermon. His word is, let's go, right? That's, that's God's word to Joshua in, in, in this chapter. It's a call to action. It's not a call to inaction where we pray a little more about whether we should be obedient to God's word or not. This is a call to immediate, immediate obedience to the revealed word of God that is based on his promises and his clear commands. Joshua chapter 1 continues to underscore this truth of obedience flows out of promise and command in clear, powerful ways. (coughs) The breakdown of the passage is fairly simple. We'll just move through the breakdown. And the first thing you see is God speaking to Joshua, right? God speaks to Joshua. <clears throat> when you think about it, put yourself in the context. The promised land, it's right over the river. It's right there in front of them. They can see it. They can smell it. The wilderness, it's right over Joshua's shoulder. Right behind him. Forty years of wandering. <laughs> think about that. 40 years. There's some of you in this room that half that age is not less than half that age. 40 years to you is you're oblivious to that idea. And there are some of you who understand. It doesn't have to be 40 years. You put whatever number you want on it. How long you've been wandering around in your sin. You've been wandering around making excuses and playing the blame game. That's the wilderness. That is behind Israel. The promised land, everything they ever desired and wanted and have been waiting for, it's right there in front of them. Powerful moment. The time has come. It's not time to debate. They're not going to get their little committees together and go, well, I wonder if we should cross this way, and I wonder if we should do that. No, they're just going to, they got to go. That's what's happening. That's the intensity of the moment. I'm pretty sure when God speaks from heaven, and there's a group of people that have been waiting for 40 years for something. He's been, I'm just pretty sure it's exciting. Right? I don't think those people are taking a nap. Don't. It's not a time to pray about what to do. Not a time to consult with as many friends as possible about the decision in front of you. It's time to go, Joshua. Let's, let's go. That's what God's saying. How will Joshua do this? That's the question, right? It's the question we dealt with last week in verses 1 through 2. How is he going to do this? The answer is um, astounding. Shouldn't be shocking to many of us. Uh, the, the answer is very simple, my dear Watson. Very simple, right? The answer simply is you get up off your butt. You get out of your miserable years of wandering around in that wilderness you've been stuck in. You get moving forward, and you do that by trusting God's promises while ruthlessly obeying God's commands. And I can hear some of you saying in your head, yeah, I get it. All the obedience talk feels like a pep talk. Yeah, you're going to get me get up out of here and go do the things that I know I probably should be doing and stop doing the things I probably shouldn't be doing. I'm hearing you, Pastor, but uh, how? Because I've tried that a million times. Anybody here try to be obedient and then find yourself back in the same pattern the next day? Okay. So just... Let's not try to pretend like that doesn't happen. So I get it. Easier said than done. You look at verses 3 through 9, 
what's God doing here? He, he's commissioning Joshua, right? He, he's commissioning him to grab the helm of the ship. He's commissioning him. He's calling him and saying, let's go. I want you to lead like you've been called to lead. God's not calling Joshua to manage something. He's calling him to lead something. He's not calling him to be a manager who gets every little piece right. He's calling him to be a leader who does the right things. You get the picture? Leaders do the right things. Managers want to do things right. And when you can't do things right, what happens? You get stuck in the mud. And you keep going back to what seems like it's worked for so long. And you wind up in a wilderness of your sin. Leaders, on the other hand, which I believe every one of us is called to, if you are a Christian or call yourself a believer, leaders, on the other hand, are called to what? Lead. Do the right things. They're big objects. They're big things, right? <coughs> That's what God is calling Joshua to. God's call to Joshua is full of promises, it's full of commands. Those promises and those commands, that's what's going to enable Joshua to do the right things. He may not do all those things right. Are you tracking with me the difference in category here? He may not do all those right things right, but he'll be doing the right things. Take a look. Dig deeper in this. Look at the promises of God here. Verses 3 through 5. God promises that every, every place that Joshua steps in this vast territory of this promised land that he's sending him into, it already belongs to you, Joshua. I've already given it to you, and I will give it to you. Now you look at the language of that. It's like, well, does it belong to him? Are you going to give it to him? Both. Because God in eternity past said it belongs to you. Now I'm giving it to you. Just like, go, go grab what already belongs to you. I'm giving it to you. <coughs> All Joshua needs to do is just simply take possession of it. You know, think of it this way. One commentator put it this way. Here's what it's like. It's like Joshua is receiving a million-dollar check. Anybody want one of those? I do. He's receiving, yeah, right. Every kid in the room is like, yes, I want that. A million dollar check could do a lot with that. It's like Joshua's receiving a million dollar check. It's been guaranteed not to bounce. Dude who wrote it, totally trustworthy. What on earth would ever stop Joshua from cashing the check? That, in a sense, is what you and I do every day that we go back to our wilderness of sin rather than walking into the promised land of rest and freedom that we've been promised in Christ Jesus. That's what you do. You take the million-dollar check you crumpled up, you throw it out there, you go, you know what, I don't trust the guy who wrote the check. That's ultimately what we do when we fall back into our sin. What would stop Joshua from, from, from cashing the check? God, God has spoken to him. He said, nobody's going to stand against you. There's no man that can take you down, Joshua. If you're afraid of people, don't worry about it. I got this. That's what God's saying. No man's going to stand against you. He's not going to oppose you for how long? The next couple of years as you overtake the promised land, and then after that, you know, then you, know, then you probably better watch your back, Joshua. No, actually, he says for the rest of your life. That's a promise that each one of us gets a piece of today. Because of the cross of Christ, you can trust, if you trusted in Christ, that for the rest of your life, your enemies cannot oppose you. They hold no more power than the power you give to them. They've been beaten. The cross and the empty tomb. Somebody's got to want to charge a mountain right now, right? Anybody want to go charge a mountain right now? Like, I'm jacked up over this. I'd jump in any wrestling ring with anybody and probably get my butt kicked. But, man, that's powerful stuff. <coughs> there isn't an enemy around that's going to be able to conquer Joshua. Why? Why is that promise true? Because God's has, has, God has promised to be with him in the same display 
of faithfulness and power that he was with who? Moses. See, now, now Joshua's like, oh, babe, like my hero, uh, the guy that I was the assistant to, I was on the mountain with him when you wrote them tablets. I came down the mountain when I found Israel doing the stupid stuff they were doing in the valley, and I saw God move in powerful ways. I was with Moses. I saw you. When you say you're going to do this through Moses, so think about this. Who in your life is that Moses? Who is that for you? That has come to you, that has said, hey, bro, hey, sister, I've seen God move in my life, and he can do the same in yours. I question, is your heart hardened or is it softened? The proof of a hard heart is what? That you're doing nothing. That you're just like, oh, yeah, yeah, I get it, brother, sister. I, I, I see what God's done in your life, and I hear what you're calling me to, but that's not for me today. I'm going to continue doing what I've been doing because I think that's best for me, or whatever platitude we put on it, right? God tells Joshua, I'm going to move in your life in the same way that I've moved in Moses' life. Who is that Moses that's in your life right now that you probably ought to be listening to and watching and learning from? Who is that? Uh, another question. Like, like, who could you be a Moses to right now? Who's looking at you and saying, oh, oh, I guess you're doing X, Y, Z in disobedience to the Lord, so it probably makes it okay for me too, right? Yeah, that seems okay. Who is that for you? Who are you a Moses to? Don't miss those principles. They're important. promise here is absolute victory that's the promise that god is giving to joshua absolute victory no enemy is going to stand against you because i will be with you wherever you go now, you go back to like i don't know if you had a mom or a dad who's like i'm telling you don't watch the tv after 10 o'clock at night the lord is watching you right <laughs> anybody i mean I, i'll use i still use that okay <laughs> have days <laughs> it's the truth the lord is there it's present omnipresent means always present ain't nothing you doing that he don't see so it's true and the flip side has a beautiful thing too everything that he has called you to do you can do i know and you know it instinctively deep down inside and the reason is because he's promised to be with you wherever you go. God's not going to call you to go to a place of obedience where he's not also going to give you the power and the energy and the enablement to do it. The only thing that stops you from walking in holiness is your hard heart, which is rooted in doing absolutely nothing. Right? That's the promise of this promise keeper. Now, shift away from promises for a minute, uh, the focus a little bit more in on the commands side of this, right? We're still under category point one here. God is speaking to Joshua. <coughs> I didn't start my timer on my clock, so I have no idea how long I've been preaching. So, you know, we'll just have to hang in there today. Oh, dear. Now, look at the commands of God in verses six through nine. Okay. Look at the commands that follow the promises. Man, don't miss that. Okay, don't, don't miss that. Just the way that it's even laid out in the text gives us a bit of a, uh, you know, a point by point here. Um, the promise comes first and the command comes second. The promise comes first and the command comes second. The, the promise is absolutely trustworthy. But the command itself here is absolutely clear. Okay? We're the only ones like to muddy up God's commands. Why do you think that is? The promise is absolutely trustworthy. The command is simple and clear. The command is this, be strong and be courageous. Yes, I like that. It's a t-shirt. That's a coffee mug. Wait, all sorts of Christians have been doing that for a long time already. We got our own coffee cubs. We got our own bumper stickers. We got our own t-shirts, all those things. They are holy. Watch out. The anointing is there. Uh, I hope you guys know I'm being sarcastic. Be strong and courageous. How do you be strong and courageous? Have you ever asked that question? Like when you're facing something heavy, facing the death of a loved one, you're facing uh, your reputation being 
killed because you do the right thing. One of your coworkers, maybe, right? You, you're facing the loss of a good friend if you do the right things rather than the wrong things. I mean, as the list is going on, there are times in life daily, I believe, where we uh, are called and have the opportunity to be strong and courageous. I mean, what does that look like? Right? How do you do Is there a secret concoction? Uh, it's, it's not really a secret. I'm going to keep coming back to the same thing. I'm preaching the same message over and over and over again. That's the beauty of preaching. You just really say one thing, and then you, you say it again, and then you say it again, and you say, you guys know why we do this, right? It's not just because we don't get it. That's part of it. The other part of it is just radically shaping. But what does a potter do with the clay? Over and over and over again, he's shaping the clay. Over and over and over again. Not just once, not just twice. Over and over and over again to shape that clay, that stubborn, hard clay. Adds a little bit of water sometimes. Gets it shaped some more until it's just right. That's what's happening in the midst of preaching, in the midst of hearing God's word, is our hearts are being shaped. Unless, unless. Your heart is a hard rock, and it ain't been replaced yet, and you've just been calling yourself a Christian, but you're really not, right? Because at that point, you don't need shaped. At that point, you need called out of the place you've been, and you need the Holy Spirit to come and give you a brand new heart so that you can actually authentically be a Christian whose heart is soft and ready to be molded and receive God's word and then do what? Act upon it. Right? The answer is um, simple, really, when it comes to um, how. How do you be strong and courageous? How? Somebody just write that down. Somebody say how. How? How? Say how do we do this? All right, right? How, how do we be strong and courageous? The, the answer it's simple. It's just something that we don't like hearing. Okay, or we like to give lip service to it, but we don't like hearing it. We don't like hearing the answer, the remedy to the problem of how to be strong and courageous. God's answer is simple: obey my word. It's simple. Simple. Obey my word. Be careful, he says. Do everything that has been written. In the Mosaic Law would be what he's saying to Joshua. There are lots of implications for us. I'm going to kind of treat it with a pretty broad application because you don't want me to get into all of that. He's just basically saying, don't turn away from my word. Don't compromise. Don't, don't say in your mind, um, you know, God's not going to mind so much if I fudge a little bit here and there. I'm not going to mind too much there. I, I, God's laws are out of date now, right? We, we all have a tendency to say that at times in various different ways. <coughs> that was for them there. Our, our laws are different now. It's all about love today. And who knows how you would define love, especially if you don't use your Bible to define it in the first place, right? That's, that's, they, there's, yeah, that's where we live today. That, that would be blasphemy, though, for us to uh, treat obedience and sin in this kind of a way god's law was never meant to be observed for a certain season and then discarded in the very next season god's law is meant to keep us safe simple god's law is meant to reveal sin in us his law is meant to help us live in spiritual and sometimes physical prosperity <laughs> who or i refuse to turn away turn away when we refuse to turn away from God's law, we refuse to take our noses out of his book, we refuse to say, oh, I think I can compromise there, like Samson. No, but Samson's problem was his eyes got the best of him. He liked pretty ladies. Ended in a really bad place for him. When you refuse to turn away from God's law, you will have success wherever you go despite the circumstances circumstances do not dictate success you know what dictates success it's just one little word we've been talking about it's called obedience and you could attach lots of other words to this too character right god's word should be on our lips at all times 
Why? Because our heart is pondering obedience to him at all times. Here's the problem, though. In Christianity, I, I'll just take this little bunny trail for a minute. The problem is, is we've got this book full of all these words. So in some regard, you could say, like, it's a religion of words. Yes, and you know what? There are unbelievers, lots of unbelievers out there. They have that indictment on us. Oh, you know all sorts of words. And your mouth is writing checks that your life doesn't pay. Right? That's the problem, really. It's called being hypocritical, hypocrisy. We claim one thing and do another, right? So lip service is an issue in the church. And my job, our job, is to discipline one another in the church, right? Um, and proclaim the word to those who are not yet part of the church. So our lives should look like we are meditating on, chewing on God's word daily. It shouldn't be lip service. It's not just talking about right theology. It's not just that. Right theology is good, but once again, doing the right things is more important. Every leader in the Pharisaical movement in Jesus' day could spout off more theology than all of us in this room combined. Pretty sure that's safe to say. The problem was they didn't do the right things. That should convict every one of us in this room who calls ourselves believers. Because it's a warning. Obedient, faith-filled, active theology. That, that which bears the fruit of obedience daily. That's what we're talking about here. <coughs> Strength and courage uh, are the fruit of an obedient heart. And an obedient heart is the result of trusting that God will be with you, not in some fanciful, uh, misguided, uh, you know, yo, do whatever you want sort of a way, right? A being an empowering, a faith-filled, a, a strong and courageous and obedient sort of a way. So if someone comes to me and says uh, that the Lord is with them, I'm a believer. I trust in God. I just stop. It's, it's so interesting how in our culture today, whether part of a church or not part of a church, it's just, it's almost like, I don't know, it's like popular to say, yeah, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, I believe there's a God, right, whether in the church or out of the church. I mean, it's usually backed up with a whole bunch of other things, like, yeah, I, I follow God, but I, well, I don't go to any church. Well, then, are you sure you're a Christian? Uh, are you sure? Because that's, it's the bride, right? Yeah, it's where the Spirit of God comes to life in community, it's right there, so I don't know, are you sure? Somebody comes to me and says, hey, I believe I'm a believer. I oftentimes want to say, hey, that's, that's Craig. Glad you believe that. I want to I encourage you. And I want to challenge you. If you think you're a believer, I want you to live obediently then. Like, I'd like to see you prove it. I'd like to see you prove your faith with obedience. Obedient, faith-filled action. That's the entire message of James, right? It really is. James comes and he goes, you know what? You can come talk about your faith all day long. Put all the slimy little words to it that you have. Do little theological things. Good job for you. Show me, by the way, that you live. Prove it. That's the message of James. It's harsh, but I love it. Why do I love it? Because I believe the church has become soft. I don't want that for us. I would rather that there be five of us sitting back in my living room. I would rather that. Right? This is why I love Joshua, right? He's just another human being. He hears the promises of God. He hears the commands of God. Then he leaps into action, doesn't he? Doesn't sit on his thumbs. Doesn't make a phone call. Doesn't send an email. Doesn't call another leader in the church. He's just like, yeah, God said it. I'm doing it. When God says, Joshua, let's flip and go, Joshua's like, yeah, I'm going to get my butt moving leads us into the second part. Joshua speaks to Israel then. Does it through uh, the other leaders. Um, and again, again, put yourself back here in Joshua's place, right? Just heard from God. God's like, hey, let's go. Let's do this. And Joshua is standing on a launching pad, basically. He's getting ready to get launched out. The wilderness of sin is in the rearview mirror. The promised land of freedom is right there in front of him. Anybody ever get a taste of that? You know, a taste of the freedom that you can have 
It's a small picture of the freedom that you can have for whatever it is that you're struggling with, sin-wise. <coughs> Beautiful moments when those happen, right? It's like a pre-taste of the rest of this divinely inspired meal that's going to nourish you in such ways that you could walk and live like you've never walked and lived before. Um, promised land is in the front window, man. It ain't going to be easy to leave the wilderness. The wilderness, that's all Joshua's known for 40 years. But Joshua, listen, listen, Joshua's not about to let the past define his future in a destructive way. Are you going to allow your past to define your future in a destructive way? Could I submit to you that if you do, you're taking that million-dollar check of God's promises and God's commands, and you're saying, I don't trust him, and I won't do what he's telling me to do. Will you do that? He already gave you a deposit. Joshua's not about to let the past define his future in a destructive way. Joshua is a man who submits to God. He trusts in God's promise of the future. Joshua does what a leader does. He trusts in God's promises and he hears God's commands and he jumps up out of his seat and he gets after He literally gets in front of God's people with his leaders and he says, let's go, people. Right? That's what he's doing. Joshua obediently passes along what God's instructions to his people are. And he passes those commands along with the promises of God in the driver's seat of the vehicle of obedience. You catch that image in your head? He passes along the commands of God with the promises of God in the driver's seat of this vehicle of obedience. Not stuck in the ditch on the side of the road. It's not stalled out and broken down. It's moving forward because God's promises are driving Verses 10 through 15, they're just basically a simple recounting of all that God has promised to do and now commands. Three days from now, God's people are commanded to take possession of the land that the Lord is giving to them. They need to do the hard work of of picking up the check, taking that check to the bank, and getting that check cashed. Can you imagine just sitting in your seat and your couch and living there and being like, you know, man, I'm so thankful I have this million dollar check. Gosh, I wish I could few more things in life. I should probably need a new vehicle. I should probably get a new house. But I'm so tired today. And I just, I just don't know if I really want to, I don't know if I should. I don't, I don't even know how to do it. How, how do you even go cash a check? Can you just imagine living that way? Joshua basically tells the people, hey, the check writer's totally trustworthy. In three days, we're going to get moving, y'all. Freaking go. Right? Really cool piece of this. I I think this is the right interpretation. Um, uh, Kind of the last things that he says, verses 12 through 15 there in this second section. God's already given some of the Israelites a taste of the promised land. That's a, that's a kind of an important thing, right? A- anybody here taste of the goodness of God? Like, I might get an amen or a hand raised right for that. If you taste of the good, goodness of God, that'd be, yeah. So, um, so that, that's what's happening here, I think, in these verses. Uh, uh, I think God's already given some of the Israelites uh, a ki- kind of a restful, a taste of the restful freedom that they have, that they're going to have in the promised land. It's kind of like a foretaste of heaven, right? Like, for me, a lot of times, that's when I eat a big, juicy steak. I'm like, that's... That's, that's heaven, boy, right? Oh, man, that's heaven. I love steak. Some of you are like, bleh, love steak. I'm sorry, there'll be a place in heaven for you, I'm pretty sure. I don't know. I think. Well, yeah. See, the, the, the Reubenites and the Gadites, God, I love their names. The Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh, they, I think they could all testify, right? They could all testify. They could all share message of the gospel, the good news of the promised land that is to come, uh, because they'd already been enjoying that portion, their portion, part of their portion, depending upon how the arguments go, okay? Um, 
At any rate, I think those three tribes could testify to what was about to take place. And God's basically saying, hey, Joshua's saying, hey, you, those warriors from those nations, because you've tasted of that, you better be there out front leading. This is an awesome picture of leadership, right? Leaders can't give what they do not have. If you don't have the gospel, you ain't going to give the gospel, right? If you don't have character, you're not going to instill character. If you don't walk in obedience, you ain't going to lead anybody else to obedience either. That's the picture here. Hey, you three tribes, I gave you a taste of this so that you can get out in front and lead so that my people can walk in the possession that I am giving to them. That's powerful. It's a crucial moment, though, this moment. It's a moment of response, isn't it? This next moment. It's a moment of response. How is Israel going to respond? How, how are they going to respond to God's commission on their lives? What's going to happen when they walk out the church doors that week? What's going to happen when they get done with their Bible study? The third section here, 16 through 18, the people speak right back to Joshua. How are they going to respond? Um, it's just like Joshua, for these people, man, the wilderness of sin, it's in their rear view, right? Keep coming back to that. The promised land of freedom is in the front window. Here's the thing. For some of you here today, um, there's enough of us in this room that most of us in the room are calling ourselves Christians. Let me just say, some of you are still wandering around in the wilderness. And you haven't figured out yet that there is a promised land in front of you right now. And that you could walk in that obedient freedom. And my fear for you is that you may never get out of the wilderness. That's my fear for you. Because the longer that you walk around in that wilderness, the more and more your heart hardens. And that's my fear for you as, as a pastor in this church. The hard part is that after a number of years of walking with folks, oh, we've all seen this. We've seen it in our own lives too, but it's it's hard and painful to talk about when you talk about other people, right? You just go, man, my brother or my sister or that friend, I don't know where they're at today because I try to talk to them about the way that they should be walking and they prove that they weren't a brother or a sister because of the way that they walked. They decided they loved their sin more than they actually loved Jesus. And, and the sad, scary thing is you can't crucify Jesus twice. He's only been crucified once. So a fear that I have, and I think it's a legit fear. It's a warning that we all need to listen to. The wilderness for uh, the Israelites that they've just known for 40 years, that's their old life, right? It's their old habits, their old way of doing relationships, their old way of doing money management. And their old way, quite simply, was stuck in the mud. Why? Because they tried to go their own way, following after cheap substitutes, Right? Comes back to idolatry once again, always. They tried going their own way. They love their cheap substitutes. I don't know who likes substitute sugar anyways, like cheap substitution sugar. I, I just, actually, I do know. Oh, I'm looking right at you. I'm sorry. Actually, I, I just, I don't think I like cheap substitute sugar, but I, I do like the way that you make things with cheap substitute sugar. So I like real sugar. That's my point. <laughs> and you can tell by the... But the, the Israelites, uh, they loved their substitutes. You remember the incident with the golden calf and the orgy in the valley, right? Remember that? That was a substitution thing. Um, the thing is this. That's all in the past. They're not there anymore on this day. The promised land is in front of them. Will Israel do the one thing that they need to do to harden their hearts, which is what? Nothing. Right? Uh, will they hear the word of God from Joshua? And do what? Nothing. Is that what's going to happen? I mean, I, I'm building this. We already know, right? If you read the passage with me, you kind of got an idea. Just track with me. Are they going to walk away, going to nod their heads to Joshua? They're going to be like, oh, great sermon, Pastor Joshua. Whoa, brother, you knocked it out of the park. The Holy Spirit was moving through you today. And get a little Pentecostal and get some, ah, at the end of it. Right? <laughs> right? Like the Holy Spirit was speaking to you, brother. This is good. <laughs> you 
knocked it out of the park, PJ. Yeah. Right? Okay. Uh, you're awake now. Ah. Is Israel going to harden their hearts by doing absolutely nothing? Are they going to murmur among themselves like they did with Moses after coming through the Red Sea? Remember that episode? If you, read, you haven't read this stuff, you need to go read this stuff, okay? It's fascinating. They come through the Red Sea. Now they're on the other side. Their enemies are flat dead. They saw this happen. And they get to the other side and they're like, oh, man, there's no food. Take us back to Egypt, Moses. Why did you do this to us? Like they're mad at their leader, right? It's like, are you going to trust the Lord or are you not going to trust the Lord? Like, what are you, what are you doing? Are they going to complain? Maybe, 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 uh, maybe they'll say, yeah, yeah, Josh, we're going to follow you there. But uh, then they're going to get there and they're going to complain about the giants. Maybe that's what's going to happen. Like, Whoa, bro, there's giants here. How are we going to make it? Oh, the spies did that a generation ago. I think that's actually why they were wandering around for 40 years. Joshua and uh, Caleb are the only two spies from that generation left alive because they were only two that brought back a good report. Their report simply was, our God can do this. Let's go. That was the message back then. And all the people were like, no, let's not go. And God was like, well, so since you won't go, you ain't going to go. You're going to stay here for 40 years. Now, 40 years later, God's back, and he's like, let's go, right? They're going to they're they're beg Joshua to coddle them in their sin. Take us back to the wilderness, Joshua. <coughs> Take us back to Egypt. Are they going to be stiff-necked like their parents? Are they going to be rebellious like the grandparents? What are they going to do? Well, read it. There's a response. The response of Israel has got to be like music to Joshua's ears. Look at what they say, verse 16 through 18. Joshua, all that you've commanded us will do. For wherever you send us will go. Catch this. This is good. Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. Music to my ears, right? You can go ahead and advance the slide to the next one. I'm almost to the end of point three here. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your commandment and disobeys your words, whatever you commanded him shall be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. That's full circle here. Like, that's the response you want to hear. Anybody who has kids, you get it, right? Any wife who has a husband, you really get it, right? Okay. That's the response you want to hear. That's a response of eager obedience. They're eager. They're willing to do what God has called them to do. They're willing to go where God has called them to go. Now, they even bless Joshua. They even remind him to be strong and courageous. They, they basically pray that, that God will be with him just like he was with Moses. At least that's what they say with their lips, right? Uh, it's fascinating if you notice that passage once again, if they say that they will obey Joshua just like they obeyed Moses. Man, that'd be like my kids coming to me and be like, we'll obey you like we do our mom. <laughs> or vice versa. I mean, it goes both ways. I'm not throwing my wife under the bus. She will hurt me later. <laughs> See, she's dangerous. Okay? Just like I married 007 in the flesh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> It's possible that uh, if Joshua remembers what Israel's obedience actually looked like to Moses, now this probably wasn't so much music to his ears. I, I, I highly doubt he was very flattered. I highly doubt that he was uh, looking at this in rose-colored glasses in any way either. <coughs> Nevertheless, that is the right response. And the right response needs to be followed up by faith-filled, obedient action and the question for us is will israel continue to obey god's word or will they harden their hearts with stubborn inaction as the story unfolds in conclusion it's the same question for us i've been asking it the whole time I've been driving it home the whole time is your heart soft will you receive it or is your heart hard are you going to reject that that's 
it comes down to. So in conclusion, man, the same question is in front of us. And it shouldn't take long for any of you here to quickly identify an area of wilderness that you've been wandering around in for years, right? You put whatever title you want, money, relationships, the wilderness of Sabbath rest, right? You just ain't able to get some rest. The wilderness of your money management issues, the, the wilderness of one flipping relationship after the next, and you can't get out of that rat wheel. Whatever the wilderness is in that you've been in, it ain't hard for any of us to find it. Sexual sin, laziness, secret habits, gossip, slander. The list goes on and on. There's junk drawer lists for these wilderness things all over the place in the Bible if you would but read it and listen to it and value it and be Christian. In the midst of all this, though, <laughs> could never leave a sermon like that, could you? Maybe sometimes we should. In the midst of all that, there is a God. Can I pro proclaim that to you? There is a God working in the storyline all the way through. And he is faithful. And he is good. And he is true. And he is loving. And he is kind. And he is merciful. And he is patient. And he's at the end of the driveway, always waiting, always calling. The hound of heaven, his Holy Spirit, never gives up on sinners who are lost, but think that they're Christian until they become Christian. That's the work of the Spirit. And our Father, who has promised, is faithful and true. He has promised that the cross and the empty tomb of Jesus Christ are enough to enable my spirit-filled obedience. That's been the promise of the scriptures all the way through. All I need to do for my heart to harden after God has spoken his word is what? Absolutely nothing. But I am thankful. Thankful that God that, that, that when Jesus surveyed the cross before him on behalf of my sin-filled, rebellious heart, what Jesus did is he joyfully cried out, hey, let's go, didn't he? He didn't say, nah, I think I better go. He said, let's go with joy, with eagerness, with willingness. It was the purpose that he came promised land of freedom from Satan's sin in the world. That is right in front of you. That you can walk in faith-filled freedom. You can. For all of you that I know in this room, I've actually watched you do it. I can testify to the Spirit of God alive inside of you doing that. You can do it because of Him who calls you. He is faithful and He is true. So look to the one who will never leave you or forsake you, and let's go. Amen? Father, I ask that you be with us as we close and enable our obedience through the work of Jesus at the cross and the empty tomb. I trust you to do that in Jesus' name. Amen.